acting, different approaches. And we all know everybody's been to some kind of training program. I can imagine has done their own due diligence homework. They've read all the books, Stanislavski, Chekhov, Muda Hagen, Boleslavski, and, and, and Gus Edwards, which I highly recommend. It's a advice to a young black actor. It's probably one of, I think, the only books about acting in, as far as our cultural references goes. It's very, very good. It has a interview with Douglas Turner Ward, who most of you probably already know, sorry, most of you probably already know, was the artistic director of NEC, the Negro Ensemble Theater, back in New York for a long time, and launched a lot of careers and produced a lot of great, great plays. Anyway, um, about training and about just what we do and the very many approaches to it. Because there are some basics, obviously. There's fundamentals that we all know about or learn about as we go along. But it's all very specific. Specificity is the operative word. Disciplines that work for Kyle or Joan or Jonas or anyone may not work for someone else. So it's a very personal, personal approach, training. And you have to find the right fit for you. You have to find a place where you can go and be challenged, not a feel-good session, not about that. It's about progressive work and developing oneself so that you can meet the demands of a specific piece of work. Here's an example. Years ago, God, about 18 years ago, we started, 19 years ago, we started doing the trilogy of plays for the love of freedom by Levy Lee Simon. And it was a trilogy of plays about the trio of black men in Haiti that led the Haitian Revolution, Toussaint Louverture, John Jacques Desjardins, and Henri Christophe. Three different plays that over a four-year period we produced, uh, mostly at the Greenwood Court Theater and later on here at LABC. Point B, this play, took place 200 years ago. More, actually. Part one took place 1793 to 1801, 1801 to 1806, and then finally to 1820. Tracking the tenure of Toussaint Louverture, Desselin, Christophe. The cast, part one, was 33 actors. Now remember, we're in a 99 seat house. 99 seats, and we got 33 actors on stage. Part two, 37 actors, and I needed three more to fight, to fight the war. So again, and in the same house, Greenway Court Theater. And part three, Henri Christophe, we did here at Los Angeles Theater Center. Here's the rub. Wonderful actors understood completely what we were doing. And by that, I mean the kind of play we were producing would never have been produced anywhere else and has since never been produced anywhere else. There have been partial readings of part one, two, or three in other parts of the country. We did a second reading to celebrate it years later here at Los Angeles Theater Center. But I'd say that there were altogether over that four-year period about 44, 45 actors involved in this production because some of those actors rolled over. They came back for part 
two, and three. So some of the same actors stay the entire four years, which is an unusual situation because, well, usually one does not live with a play that long. One does not live with a play that long. In this culture, especially here in Los Angeles, where everything is seemingly on a fast track, uh, you know, a full-length play is rehearsed for four days, uh, four weeks, and it's usually put up, maybe five weeks, and then it's usually put up. So the preparation time is very limited. And now we're talking about 200 years ago, a period piece on an island, a colonial island in the, in the West Indies. So what had to happen is that we have to create that whole world. We had to do that. One of the things that was a great challenge to actors was that they couldn't get their head around the fact that 200 years ago, those of us who had been in Spain and recently liberated were new to all of that. They did not have the swagger that us contemporary Negroes have. The way we walk, the way we talk, the way we carry ourselves here in the 21st century is very different than what was happening back then. So this was a challenge for those to wrap their head around that and to shed that swagger, that 21st century swagger, and start to understand how to do, how to play, how to live in that community at that time. And they took a lot of notes because at times no one wanted to be an ex-slave. We all want to strut what we strut, usually. So it was difficult for some actors. Everybody came around sooner or later, mostly mid-later, I'd say. But this was a task. This is something that one has to be ready for, and this is what the play demanded. It demanded that. So, the kind of training, the kind of consciousness that one must enter into to go there and live there, inhabit that, is work. One has to psychologically, physiology, physically, figure that out. Training can help there. Reading. I always am a promoter of, of reading. Every actor, every actor, if you don't have one, shame on you. You should have a library. And a deep library. Library of plays, library of reference books, library of culturally referenced material that for most of us who are black actors, we need to know about that if we don't already know about that and don't immerse ourselves in that. You know, I, August Wilson, right? 10 plays covering 100 years, 1910 through to the end of the century, just about, right? Almost in the end of the century. And each of those periods is different. Each of those plays requires different demands from the actor, even though they're very much connected. Some of the same characters are in some of the same plays and reference that those plays. So, I, I, I put a lot of stock in his treatise 
the ground on which I stand. Those of you who, who know me or who have been in the workshop on occasion know that um, I usually hand out at the beginning a copy of his 13-page treatise that he gave in 1998 as a response to Bernstein's remark. I just want to read just a little bit of it to you because it's, it's chapter and verse, and it's about colorblind casting, right? All right. And I'm in the middle of this, so. To mount an old black production of Death of a Salesman, or any other play conceived for white actors as an investigation of the human condition through the specific of white culture is to deny our own humanity, our own history, and the need to make our own investigations from the cultural ground on which we stand as black Americans. It is an assault on our presence, our difficult but honorable history in America and an insult to our intelligence, our playwrights, and our many and varied contributions to the society and to the world at large. The idea of colorblind casting is the same idea of assimilation that black Americans have been rejecting for the past 400 years. For the record, we reject it again. These are August Wilson's words. For the record, we reject it again. We reject any attempt to block us out, to reinvent history, and ignore our presence or to maim our spiritual product. We must not continue to meet on this path. We will den deny, we will not deny our history and we will not allow it to be made to be of little consequence, to be ignored or misinterpreted. In an effort to spare us the burden of being affected by an undesirable condition and as a gesture of our benevolence, many whites like the proponents of colorblind casting say, oh, I don't see color. We don't want you to see us. We, are, we want you to see us. We are black and beautiful. We are not patrons of the linguist environment that has us as unqualified and violators of public regulations. We are not a menace to society. We are not ashamed. We have an honorable history in the world of men. We come from a long line of honorable people with complex codes of ethics and social discourse who devise myths and systems of cosmology and systems of economics who were themselves part of a long social and political history. We are not ashamed and do not need you to be ashamed for us, nor do we need the recognition of our blackness to be couched in abstract phrases like artists of color. Who are you talking about? A Japanese artist, an Eskimo, a Filipino, a Mexican, a Cambodian, a Nigerian, an African American? Are we? to suppose that if you put all of them to one side of the scale and one white person on the other side of the scale, that it would balance out. That whites carry that much spiritual weight. That one white person balances out the rest of humanity lumped together as nondescript people of color. We reject that. We are unique and we are specific. We do not need colorblind casting. We need some theaters to develop our playwrights. We need those misguided financial resources to be put to a better use. We cannot develop our playwrights with the meager resources at our disposal. I'll stop there. At the beginning of this, August Wilson states that he does not speak to everyone. So understand that. 
This is not supposed to be chapter and verse of Bible for what we, but I'm sure, pretty certain that you probably agree with much of that. And if you read all 13 pages, you would probably agree with much more of that. I find it infuriating that we are apt at times, myself included, put on the defensive and find that we are justified existence. I don't feel that we need to justify anything about ourselves our artistry, how we do what we do, our frames of reference, as he said, valid all the way down the line. This is us. That's what actors are made of, is experience. And that's what we draw from when we go to work. Colorblind cast, they don't want to... <laughs> I'll leave that alone. I'll leave that alone. Um, so, oh yeah, reading. <laughs> you should have a library. You should have all 10 of August Wilson's plays, all 10 of Tennessee Williams, all, all yeah, seven of Tennessee Williams's plays. It should have Leslie Lee's plays in it. It should have Uta Hagen's book, Respect for Acting. In it. We are actors in whatever source forwards, progresses, moves us closer to what we should be and how we should bring to the table the fullness of who we are and our talents wherever we can get that source and inspiration from is valid, whether it be Chekhov to the actor Stanislavski's, an actor prepares, whether it be Boleslavski's Six Lessons in Actors, whether it be Gus Edwards, a conversation with Douglas Turner Ward in the first half of that book is definitions that apply specifically, again specifically, to black artists. Read it. Inspiration. The demands for us are paramount. They're over the top. Yes, doing fine, it looks like, right? You look at television, you look at the movies, you go to the theater, some theater, some theater, some theater, some theater, and you see us, and you see other ethnicities that are part of the population, part of the artists that make theater in the Los Angeles County and around the country and around the world. But one must be diligent, vigilant, that the small gains that we've made are not usurped. Three steps forward, two steps back. I think in 1971, there were something like over 300 theaters in the country, 300 black theaters in this country, as a result of the civil rights movement and the momentum and the demands of those of us who were part of the civil rights movement because there was money flowing, just as there's money flowing now because of the Black Lives Matter movement. There is a lot of funding going on to Black folks now because of the pressure and because of what has happened. It's not gonna last long, three or four months, then it'll go away, watch. That's what happened in 71. There was plenty of money to go around, over 300 theaters. By 1973, late 73, 
there were something like less than 120 theaters left. Now, there's a lot of reasons. A lot of reasons. One of the big reasons is that the artists who founded those theaters, many of them were not administrators. They were artists. And there is a difference between the two, as you know. And Marva is shaking her head like she knows where that, from which I speak, because she is one of those administrators that allows us to continue with her contributions of the behind the scenes that nobody even really knows about, but without it, the theater is not going to happen. Is not going to happen. It's not certainly not going to sustain. So that was a problem that passionate artists, wonderful storytellers, great talents. But the day-to-day -day work, the day-to-day -day sometimes monotonous work, sometimes painful work of dotting I's and crossing T's putting up those grants, finding that public funding, developing those relationships with the public funders so that they recognize you and say, okay, the Roby Theater Company is now five years old. Maybe they've been submitting proposals for the last three years and we haven't recognized them. We, we, haven't, we haven't deemed to fund them. Well, they've been around now. Maybe we should look at them a little more closely and maybe we should support them financially. Those kinds of things, it takes time, it takes time. And it takes someone who is going to stay the course. Often artists, they're not wired that way. And it's not to say that they should be wired that way. There are other artists Call them artistic administrators. You know, I spent a little time doing a film in Japan, just enough time to start to understand, begin, to just begin to understand a little bit about Japanese culture. And that here on this side of the world, we look at Japanese culture, the most popular aspects of Japanese culture, the martial arts, which has been touted, you know, and then. And, and all of that um, as what we recognize as martial arts. Well, really what martial arts are in Japan, the same guy, same gal that breaks boards and does all of those disciplines that are usually having to do with action, Bruce Lee, et cetera, that's the same person who does the flower arrangement, who does the tea ceremony, who gets out of bed in the morning, and it is an art form, how they roll out of the bed, how they greet you with a bow that says, I respect you, I consider you, how they present their card with both hands to you and look you in the eye and bow. And this is how they roll. This is what they do. This is how they live. Their life is an art form for most of the culture. The whole life. Not just moments, but the whole life. And the administrative work that we do. The administrative work that all of those people in those administrative positions in the arts. This is a way to make it into an art form, to approach it, to get one's head wrapped around that so that it ceases to be something that we toil at and begins to be an art form unto itself. And once one approaches it that way, it actually can turn into fun also, also as well as the continued discipline on looking at life as a beautiful puzzle painting that we are the 
authors of the canvas. So, hmm, hmm. a way of thinking, that's what I'm really interested in, in looking at the different approaches to acting, how we think about it. Anybody can walk and talk and probably not bump into the furniture, right? Not everyone can look you in the eye and tell the truth, as James Cadby said when he asked, when he was asked by somebody, what is acting? You look the other guy in the eye and you tell the truth. That's acting. That was his definition of it. And there's a lot of truth in that, too. That giving and receiving, that communion that goes on between the artists that are telling the story. Discipline. I tell you, there's a lot of raw talent out there. We've all seen it. Boom, one shot. Compare it to athletics, those who track sports. We see all of those high profile sportsmen, sportswomen who excel in some extraordinary way in their sport, in their art form, in their discipline. We see probably the final results in the competitive arena. What we don't see is how they prepare. and what it takes to get to a level that we look at and say, God, how do they do that? And how do they do that day after day, game after game, competition after competition? How do they do that? It's work is what they do. They work at it. They work at it every day. If they're not physically working at it, believe me, they're thinking about it. They're, it's just part of their consciousness, which is part of the game. Same for us. Same for us. We have to... live here. Start here. ID what we need to do and then do it continually. Otherwise, there's inconsistencies that will happen. We've all seen somebody with that as a gifted person, but they have no discipline. And what happens on many occasions is that person, they are a superstar for a moment. And then they drop the ball. Because sustaining a discipline at a very high level is not something that is, let's say, natural without training, without practice, without a commitment. And it's the same for us. The same for us. The commitment to the performing arts, the acting, the dancers, those disciplines, that performing arts, it must be, a, I have a, I have a, I'm wondering about folks who come, because a lot of people come to me all the time, young actors come from out of town, and they've, sell, they, they've saved their four, five, six thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars at home, they worked hard for it, and they were perhaps a big fish in a little pond, someplace, somewhere, and they come to Los Angeles, and they come to Hollywood to make their fortune, to try to do something and become something of significance. And they come with that money, they come with an idea, and they say, okay, I'm gonna give it two years. I'm gonna give it one year. And if I don't make it, whatever that means, I'm not sure about what that means sometimes. Whatever that make it in that one year, I'm going home. I'm gonna go be a doctor. I'm gonna go be a construction worker. I'm gonna go be a cab driver. I'm gonna go be a school, or whatever. But if I don't make it in that one year, I'm done. 
I tell those people probably to go home now. Don't waste your time. Because you don't know how long anything is going to take. And again, specificity is it all. It might take me 10 years. It might take you two months. One never knows the values that one comes with to do this work, to work these disciplines on an ongoing, consistent basis is paramount. You have to know what your values are. You have to pinpoint them. You have to work that out. And then you can take some measurements, perhaps, of how far you want to go. It's life, there are no promises. Let's face it, let's be frank. There are no promises. No one makes you a promise that you are going to find work. My first year here back in 1983, good year, the good year, the good year. I came in March of 1983. I did a play. I was invited to do a play. Paul Ropes, Philip Hayes Dean's one person show. Paul Ropes and had done it up north. And I was invited down here to do it at the Odyssey Theater before it was the Odyssey Theater over on Sepulpa there. Sepulpa there. And um, things went well. Then I did it at the Ebony Showcase Theater before it was the Nate Holden Performing Arts Center. And I did some episodic television work. Did a, a, a movie of the week. Had a great year. And I thought, oh, cool. This is, supposed to, this is what's supposed to happen, right? This is what is supposed to happen. This is how it's supposed to go. I'm supposed to get the best of both worlds. I'm doing this show, which is known as a one-person show. But believe me, there is no such thing as a one-person show. It doesn't exist. You may be the only one on stage, but you have a whole collaboration support system behind you. And anyway, I came to do a show, did well. I felt good about it. We had good audiences. There was all the hoopla that one can muster for that kind of thing at that level, meaning that level, meaning 60 seat house, the Odyssey Theater, and then did the other. I had never done really television work. I had not done any episodic work. And things went well. 1984, I was painting the walls of the Broadway department store to make ends meet. Full 1984, making money, doing that. 84, nothing. Couldn't get arrested. Going out on calls, couldn't. <laughs> 1985 comes, mostly the same. Then I got a film, important film, Color Purple. Things went well. Things went well. And for me, things have gone fairly well. I've been able to chisel out a, 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 a career, a career. I've been able to work as an actor and been able to practice craft. And the Roby Theater Company is probably the crowning glory of it all in the sense that I've been part of this and been able to do the kind of work that we do. Most of you have been a part of. So again, nobody makes any promises to you here because anything can happen. Anything can change your destiny for the better or for the hmm, not so better, right? So one must be diligent. One must work hard. Stay focused. Be a self-starter. Nobody gives you anything. You wait for your agent to find you a job. Good luck. Good luck with that. They find jobs for people who are working. Usually that's the way that works. 
If you're not working, they send you out on call and you're on your own. So given technology these days, it's very, very uh, important and industrious and the right thing to do to become a producer, to get with like minds and produce your own work. I'm sure some of you are. I see it. Some of you are. You're doing whatever you're doing and uh, working hard, working, which is as it should be, as it should be. Questions? Anybody? Mel, I have to unmute Mel. Yes, okay. My next question, my next observation was when you talked about the actors that picked up the script and they didn't want to commit to being the slaves. Right. The, as, uh, actors, the revolution. as actors, our jo- just like when you did the thing about Toussaint Laventure, our job as actors, in order to bring those words to life, we have to commit to the character. We have to commit to the demands of the character and bring the writer's words to life. That's a commitment that comes from, like Ben talks about, our commitment to constantly work on ourselves, whether it's Chekhov or Strasbourg or whoever it is. I just finished a Chekhov uh, summer workshop and that came, this conversation came up again. Your responsibility of the actor is to work on your discipline and commit to telling the truth of that character, working with your director. And I've noticed that as I'm, people have classes and because I used to teach, they come and say, step into our class and give us a few words. And it's like that commitment is not being taught to actors that are not actors of color. But all of us that are actors of color, whether we went to the Black Theater Festival, it's like commit as an actor to the discipline of learning your craft and staying sharp on your craft. Yes. Uh, If that's the question, I agree. Uh, and And those are the answers that you just cited once again. I just wanted to say Barbara Montgomery, Barbara, uh, Barbara Ann Tier was part of the beginning of the Negro Ensemble Company. I'm an alumni of the Negro Ensemble Company with Charles Weldon as my um, acting coach and trainer. So I know all the history of the Negro Ensemble Company, especially in New York. I'm from New York uh, and New Federal Theater with Woody King. Uh, but Barbara Antier was a part of the beginning of the Negro Ensemble Company, but then she started her own theater company for whatever reasons, her and Robert or whatever, <laughs> and uh, she started the Black Theater, Black National Theater in New York. So mm-hmm. anyway. Still going on. To... Pardon me? Which is still happening. Which is still, which is still there, and it's the only Black-owned building where she owns her own company and she owns her own building, which I did. I, I, I have to try to get that to you. I did a great interview with her, um, me being an actress and her being being an actor at one point, but owning her own company and stuff. It's on tape that uh, we did in New York a while ago before she passed away we did this great interview with her that i have on tape but yes she's the only one that owns her own building as well i'd love to hear that tape pardon me i would love to hear that tape yeah i'm in i'll get um i have it i have it somewhere in the archives of all of that if i don't i'll get who produced it to give it back give it to me again and I'll get it to you Ben but I just wanted to say speak on the fact of the, all the theaters that we had and all the theaters that we don't have now and one of the things that we talk about in New York that we were talking about in New York I'm in LA now 
was that it said that New Federal uh, and all the black theaters didn't own their own buildings. And a lot of times if we don't own our own buildings to where we could sustain our own culture and our own companies, then we get priced out of that building or we have to move out of that building and it makes the company um, not be there anymore because it kind of like scatters and not have a place in a home. Um, the Hadley players had their own building for a while. I can't, uh, what's, what's the Hadley players? I can't think of her name right now. It's killing me. Um, but it, they're in New York. And um, she was an actress as well, Ben. Uh, but anyway, um, and they had their own building for a while. I, I don't even think the uh, Harlem uh, Classical Theater of Harlem doesn't even own their own building. So I think it's sad. I think that that's something that we need to really uh, address in black theater is finding a space that we own, that we can produce our own. And maybe it's a conglomerate of uh, Ben and wh or whoever else is in, in, in Los Angeles or even in New York and finding that and sharing that space for a while and building it up like the Asians and the Vietnamese do. They start with one building. I mean, I'm not talking about theater, but in their concept of they will come here and they will buy one store everybody will work in that store. And then all those people in that store end up buying the whole strip mall and then the whole block because they've fed, they've cut, they've uh, helped each other up. And we don't, and we don't do that. And I think, I mean, I'm not going to just make that a blanket statement right. because we do, I won't make that a blanket statement, but I'm just saying in the theater, if we kind of, collaborated in doing something like that, then maybe we don't have to ask anybody what we're going to produce and how we're going to produce it and how we're going to... Um... I think you're absolutely right. We're working on that. The Ruby Theater Company is working on that. We have a strategic plan in place and we have steps for fundraising. And it's, it's again, we've been here 25 years. And I'll just leave it at this because it can be a, a longer story. We are working on that. We have earned the currency to seek out sources that can help us to make that happen. So, yeah. But again, we need support from a lot of places because God knows it ain't cheap. No, and maybe we can get you can. I mean, because I'm a part of the NWCP theater committee right now, so we've been talking about how we can support black theater even more, mm. and that's one of the things that we've been talking about. And I've been stressing that we have to support black theater a lot more than we do. So that's my last comment. So thank okay. you, Thais. Ben, if I can just say, yes, you are. We are at the point where we're looking for locations, like Ben is scouting the list of potential locations now. And so we are um, going to be needing theater community folk uh, to support the effort very soon. So be brainstorming about ways you can do that and, and, and the like, because we could find a place tomorrow and then the whole plan changes. Absolutely, and let me know. Send me some information so I can pass it on to the NAACP Theater Committee so we can support that. Well, the message right now is that we're at the point of looking locations to get. And, as, you know, that, that could take next week or that could take five months. But everyone should be thinking about ways they can support if they have um, folk who uh, can be donors or who have some expertise that they can lend. That's where we are. everyone in the theater community should be if they want to support the Roby Theater Company's new venture. Thank you. And I'm answering questions about volunteering all that in the chat box. About the work, questions about the work. But that's what we're focusing on today is the work. Come on, come on. There's Ella. I have to release Ella's 
mic to unmute. Oh, that would be you again. Hi. Um, hey. I don't know if I necessarily have a question, but I think some things that you said really resonated with me, especially <clears throat> when you were reading August Wilson's, um, his manifesto, and then you were commenting on the specificity of the work. It just reminds me that there, as you said, there are many ways that you can approach the work and it is very personal, but there is also something to be said about being in training and community with black folks that is different than being in training and community with people who are not black. And <clears throat> I learned that very specifically, I learned that very specifically being trained at a university that was predominantly white. And then, you know, you, if you go on to the path and you're looking to get an MFA or something like that, many of the programs that you're looking at are predominantly white. And even at the point of the auditions, feeling that there was not a connection and then stumbling onto um, the Harlem Theater Company in New York and, and taking on training there. That was the first time that I was really exposed to black theater. Wow. Even though I had played parts in undergrad where I was black or, you know, we were exposed to plays, but it was black theater as a whole, meaning embodying voice, embodying gesture, embodying philosophy. There is a difference between that training and the training that I got in undergrad, which completely changed how I approached the craft. Um, and I don't necessarily know if everybody sort of like understands that off, off the bat, if that's, something that um, people consider as they look for training and look to be in community with other actors. But I think it's extremely critical and not always intuitive for everyone. Our culture, again, the word specificity. After a while, you know, you hear the same word. Sometimes you just dismiss it. But the word specificity is the operative word. We are very specific people at every juncture of the way. Our journey here in this country has been very, very specific. That's what August Wilson was working at and succeeded. Hitting that, exhibiting that. And when a company of actors, an ensemble of actors, hit the mark doing his work, there's nothing like it. There is nothing like it. Being lean closer to the, to the computer bins. Yeah. Thank the you. saying about August Wilson's work is very specific to our culture, and that's what he was working at. And when he hits the mark, uh, or when a company of actors hits the mark, an ensemble, and it works, it is something to behold something, there's a revelation. We learn something, we are revealed. We remember some things that are in our bones, but not in our minds, that are in our guts and in our it's a visceral. So yes, working with a, a, a group of black actors is very different, no matter what. I, spent, I trained for five years at the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, which was the premier West Coast ensemble theater company during the late 60s and through to the early 80s. They did eight to 10 productions a year and everything from Moliere to William Congreve, of course, Shakespeare, Tennessee Williams, Sam Shepard, all of them above. And they were a white company completely a white company. They did beautiful work. The work they did was exceptional work because they were a true ensemble. Some of those people that were part of that company had been part of that company for 15 years. That's the definition of an ensemble, a group of actors who work together for a length of time in all of all the, everything from contemporary work to classical work to stylized to 
the Comité de l'Art, they did all of that, and only through time and only through working together can you develop a certain kind of trust with your colleagues that this is something that you can't teach, you have to earn it, and it takes time. And they were wonderful. They had exchanges with Russia, with England, with Australia, with Japan, sent their company over there. Those companies came over to the Geary Theater up in San Francisco, did wonderful work. None of us was in there. You understand? None of us were part of that company on occasion, on a rare occasion during the 70s, maybe one. It was a black actors workshop, which I studied there for three years. I became the director of the Black Actors Workshop and later became uh, part of the formal company there. But they hired me mainly to teach, not to really be an actor in the company. Here's a small example, then we'll go back to some questions. Small example of how that worked. The Black Actors Workshop, which met twice a week, 10 week sessions. 12 week sessions, twice a week, basically downstairs in the evening, two or three hours in the evening. Community of uh, black community in, Los in uh, San Francisco, actors who wanted to work in the discipline, mostly not trained, looking for a place to train, looking for a place to be, looking for a place to work. We did that. Over a two year period, worked with many of the same actors, did projects, meaning actual plays, mounted actual plays as part of the training program, as well as the basic discipline workshop classes. Everything from scene work to voice to uh, stage combat to all, all of the disciplines were offered. After two years with, say, 18 to 20 actors, I went to the executive director there at ACT, a man named Edward Hastings, who actually is the guy that brought me in to ACT to train and to later become a part of the company and gave me a scholarship. Why? Because they needed a black actor in there. They needed a black actor to be the face on the brochure. <laughs> this is part of it. Yes, part of it. Right. Time. Ed, Ed, Ed is deceased now, and he, a really nice guy and a wonderful director. Nice guy, white man, very much a white man. I went to him after two years of the Black Actors Workshop and said, "Ed, you know, we've done some good work. You've seen it." We'd like to do Raisin in the Sun. This is before pre-August Wilson, don't forget, 70s. We'd like to do Raisin in the Sun. There's enough actors and they're experienced enough. We've been working on scenes. You can come and see what we're doing. We'd like to do it. Now remember, there's a company of 40 actors that are on the payroll. They got weekly rages. They did not have to do a second job They didn't because they were equity actors, they were getting weekly salaries. All they were, were the ideal situation of what an actor is. They would get their assignments, their parts, a year before the actual play went into rehearsals most of the time. The principals would know they were going to do Pedagoot or Summer in Smoke or whatever knew it a year in advance so they could actually put into practice what Stanislavski and Chekhov were talking about. Because in the Russian theater back at the turn of the century, they were, what they were doing was they were designing their productions two to three years. Get me? Two to three years before a production, you were cast in a play and you were living with that part for that long a time before you went into formal rehearsals. So boy, you had time to do your homework. All, all of it. 
every bit of it. Everything from the physicality of understanding that there were no cars back then. So how did people get around? How did they move the dresses that women wore, the boots that men wore? They made them physically behave in a certain way. They stood in a certain way. They right. sat down in a certain way. Right. And Feldenkrais and Alexander quote techniques that were taught at this work, at, at the American Conservatory Theater, aided the actors in finding how to do that, how to execute that at ACT. They, and they had a year to do that. And that those uh, trainings were available to them year round. All to say that those actors, 40 or so actors in the company, when I asked Ed, we're ready to do this, Ed, he said to me, what do we do with the actors after we do Raisin in the Sun? Because Raisin in the Sun has nine actors in it, nine black actors in it, right? And so if they produce Raisin in the Sun, it's part of the company's productions, which means they had to admit those black actors into their company and couldn't figure out. Now, this was a truly a liberal white man, nice guy, sweetest guy you ever want to meet, would listen sincerely. I believed him. When he, t when he said things, I could see that he was wanted to understand, but he couldn't. His mindset was already in place. He did not know to think. This was before colorblind casting. This was before any of that concept was in place. That was all, what do I do with black actors after we do race it in the sun? I don't see them doing anything else that we do. I don't see them doing Shakespeare. I don't see, see them doing Chekhov. I don't see that. There's no parts in there for Sam Shepard's stuff. Uh, 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 Tennessee Williams, William Congreve, uh, uh, Moliere, all, wh what do we do with those? We don't, I don't know what to do with them. This is basically what he was saying. Yeah. So that has evolved now. But the word of caution and that word about being diligent, uh, 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 what is it? that word, some of those same people that were there 30, 40 years ago and proponents of we can't do anything with any actors of color because we don't see them in the work that we do because this is Eurocentric work. We don't see them in that. Some of those same people are still running companies around the country, around the world. Some of those same people. Now, politically correctness has changed them and that's where this colorblind casting came to at one point and that. But I don't believe that many of them have changed their way of thinking about this. Because it's a difficult thing. It's a difficult thing to change your whole way you're wired. Yeah. Because of how you've lived, what you've been exposed to, and what have been your priorities up to and including a certain Point. Let's face it, most theater companies are founded by people who have a very clear vision about what they want to do. Roby Theater Company is founded that way. It's very clear. We produce and develop works about the global black experience and reinterpret black classics. It's not just experience, global experience, it's black experience, 
and it's black classics. That's what we do. And it's training for us. Most Eurocentric companies, that's what they're that's what they're doing. That's what they're developing. That's what they're working on as far as their own classics, all the classics that we probably already have been exposed to. So keeping all that in mind, that's where our vigilance should come in. And if you want to, you can do that. And God bless you. You should. If you have an opportunity, because there's an oppor- with, with that opportunity, there's an opportunity to learn something. And whenever you have an opportunity to learn something, grab it. Grab it. It's important. It's what we all need to expand our consciousness. We don't get the opportunity all that often. But when we do, we should seize it. Okay. Here's Kim Saunders. Kim. How you doing, brother? Good to see you again. Only see you on the screen. <laughs> All right. Questions, folks. Akushua, I see you. Good to see you, Ben. Really, really good to see you. Uh, I'll come up with a question before it's all said and done, but I just wanted to share how much I just really care about you and the Roby Theater and everything you guys have been doing for a long time. So. I'm still here, buddy. All right. The family good? The family's great. The family's great. You know, you got to kiss it for me. I promise. And they, they ask about you all the time. <laughs> oh. Hi, Ben. My name is Jonas. This is my first time that I've joined this meeting. It's really cool. Hey, Jonas. Uh, um, I live also here in Hollywood. Uh, I'm originally from Brazil. So I've been living here, just trying to read my goals. Um, and I have a question about the the theater, the Robert Theater. How do you, do how they are still providing the acting class? Uh, are they uh, still have any Zoom meeting? They are providing provided acting class. How like the the theaters uh, have been changing for this pandemic? Because because of everything COVID-19, no. The acting workshop is an advanced scene study workshop. And what we do in that workshop is work on scenes, scenes alone with actors, with other actors. And because of COVID, I've discontinued that workshop because I don't see a way to do that Zoom-wise. Monologues, Yes, singular ways, singular work in that sense, yes. But I'm looking at September to see whether or not we can find a way to actually go back into a theater with a group. I usually take 14 actors and we do a 10-week session. Each actor is doing two scenes over uh, the 10 week session, each scene is done twice. So each actor works four times. I choose the scene, I partner up the actors and schedule when you're going to present the scenes. The scenes are presented on one evening, usually a Monday, always a Monday night at seven o'clock. And the scenes are presented then usually a five, 10 minute scene, sometimes two people, sometimes more. And then there is a conversation and then we get up back up on our feet and work moment to moment on the scene. That work is taken home by the actors. They go back into rehearsals. The rehearsal process is on their own. The actors rehearse on their own and bring the work in. They go back into rehearsals, implementing the notes, the conversations that we've had and bring the scene back a second time and seeing what progress we've made. Again, it's important to understand that this is not a classroom in the sense of academia. This is a workshop in the truest sense of the workshop because the work 
is paramount. You cannot learn how to quote, act, unquote, by reading a book. You can learn a lot. Don't get me wrong, because that library, like I said, is all important. They're all reference books. They all give you ideas. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the rehearsal process must be gone through. There are no shortcuts. And when the curtain goes up, that's the work is presented. You have to do it, in other words. You all know that. You all know that. But I have to, I emphasize it because there can be a lot of talk about acting. I know people who can talk, God, they're brilliant. They can just, they get it. They get it intellectually. But some of those people, they're not actors. They can't do it, nor should they, nor are they even trying to get up, enter an environment, and play, and suspend disbelief of an audience. That's the work. That's the chore. That's the goal. And you only get to do that regularly and do it well when you do it regularly, like anything else. Working out, you go to the gym every day, you think you're going to gain, get cut up or get good at whatever your sport is by doing something once a week, once a month. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And this discipline is the same. You think about it, you work on it, you do it every day. All that homework, that's for you. That's not for anybody else. There's not going to be any applause for that kind of work. No applause. You just do that because it's what's required for you to excel. To you to bring up that work that you're doing to a level where there is, I'm watching this, and there's a revelation in that cross that that person just did from stage right to stage left, look in the mirror to see what? Mm -hmm. The workshop, though, I'm looking at September, Jonas. I'm looking at September to see... Again, because of COVID-19, who the hell knows what's going on with this thing? You I mean, have two hands raised, Ben. Yeah. Uh, ben, um, I had a question in that um, getting back to producing our own experiences, I think most of us are aware that we should be doing that, and we are aware that um, this is needed, especially in this day and age. But it comes down to financing. A lot of uh, um, theater companies simply don't have the funding that is necessary. And I'll use my own theater company or the theater company I'm a member of, which is Town Street Theater. They had their own space. And when the funding dried up, well, they lost their space. And so now they're associated with Stella Adler. And so they produce in conjunction with Stella Adler. They do original work uh, interpreting our experiences, but it's all about funding. That's the whole issue right now, I think. And the answer so to that have... is it, it's work. Like I said, you got somebody like a Marvel who is a development person and is adept at this work, as well as other things she is adept at. Uh, a true artist and administrator. Every day, that person or persons, if you're lucky enough to actually have a staff, as opposed to one lone person who's doing that, a staff in place that 
can do the due diligence work because the money's out there. The money is out there. And it is specifically earmarked, some of it, for us. So the work is finding where those sources are, developing those relationships with those project directors, with those CEOs, which is the best way. If you can get to the CEO and develop a relationship with that person, they talk to the project director and say, hey, Town Street deserves our support. Make it happen. They're going to write you a proposal, but we, I want you, me, the CEO, want you to fund them. If they ask for $20,000, maybe they don't get $20,000. Maybe they only get ten this year. But if they use that ten well, next year, you see where I'm going with that. But it, it's just work. It is like everything. You get up early and you go to bed late. That's the name of the game. I'd like to say that shift that artists need to be um, ready to make um, because we're so committed to the art. Um, the, the daily work of becoming a donor-centric organization, understanding that becoming that does not take away from the art. It helps you fund the art. So it's about making that commitment to culture shift becoming a donor-centric organization, and then it becomes easy. Now it's second nature to Roby. I have a question, um, a two-parter. One, when you were talking about the art and the craft and how we develop, our how we get into the character, who we are, and things like that. And sometimes I find that uh, because I've studied different techniques and methods sometimes I try to combine them in one space because sometimes one isn't getting me where I need and then I try to figure and so I try to combine the you know the Stanislavski with the Meisner and all that at one because sometimes you find that when you're working maybe something's not getting you where you need to be and where you want to go, and so you use something else, and, and so I'm glad that I have those two or three methods already, and I try to deal with um, going to what they eat, how they eat, how they like to eat, what makes, you know, and especially I've done a slave play before, so it really was a humbling experience to take away my my mouth <laughs> and all the things that make Thais who she is. And, and so I, I was dealing with, I, when you talk about developing a character, I try to go into that and I, and I have one little trick I do. I give them a, a, a astrological sign and then I go study their sign, that mm -hmm. sign, whatever that is, just try to pick up other little small things in, in maybe helping to develop, who that person is and their character, but I like to deal with what they eat, how they eat, how they smell. One of the things I I wanted to make sure that when I played a slave that I smelt like a slave. Slaves didn't take baths every day. So there's a funk and an odor that has to be with it. I mean, that was one of the things with Harriet that I didn't believe her in because I didn't smell her on stage. I needed to smell her on the screen and I didn't smell her. I didn't smell the funk of being a slave. Mm. And so anyway, but then my other part is, is that w when you were talking about um, out of the box casting, what did, I forgot the name of what you're calling it. Uh, Color blind. Huh? Color blind. Colorblind casting. Mm. I mean, I've saw, I've seen, uh, Streetcar Named Desire as a color, colorblind, I, you know, you know, they did that in um, color. I forgot where they did it in Colorado or. Uh, or they did it in Broadway on Broadway too with Blair Underwood too. I thought that was street. That was Streetcar. Oh yeah, they did that in yeah, and then they did um, something else on Broadway too that I saw that. Uh, colorblind. Debbie Allen. Debbie Allen directed it. Uh, I can't think of the name of it right now. 
Uh, but what do you think about it? I mean, do you think about it as a, as a, a tool for us to be able to do Shakespeare and Tennessee Williams? I mean, we already do Shakespeare and he wrote uh, African, but like Tennessee Williams or Sam, or, you know, like I did see uh, Glen Gary, Glenn Ross as, as, as a colorblind mm -hmm. uh piece as well but i mean do you think that's been a, is how do you think that's helping us or is that hindering us or is that opening doors just for us response, that we couldn't do before just a, just a response to a couple of things however way you can get to what you need to get to to play a part is legitimate if you have to layer on various formal Meisner, Stanislavski, or one of those folks, Russians, <laughs> that did so much work in, and on, on human behavior, because really that is what acting is all about. It's the study of human behavior and heightening that through, through drama and through a, a theatrical sense. However way you can get to what you need to get to is legitimate. If you have to go and stand on your head in the corner, and break wind to get to where you need to get to, by all means, go stand in the corner, break wind to get your head right to play the part. It's all legitimate, whatever it takes. People have their own techniques, their own methods, their own ways of doing things. Our modern society, and as things develop, look what Zoom. With Zoom, we can do things with this. I'm just starting to understand that because I'm such a Neanderthal when it comes to technology, you know, uh, but I'm starting to understand how this can serve us. As far as doing Eurocentric classics, well, Shakespeare, there's three black parts in Shakespeare and none of them are women. I know. Aaron, the Moor, Titus Andronicus, Othello, of course, and uh, the Prince of Morocco and Merchant of Venice. Those are the three parts written by Shakespeare as black characters. Yeah, there are, uh, if you can get an opportunity to do Shakespeare and you want to, do it. There are no rules. My view on this is for the Roby Theater Company, there is such a body of work that exists for us that is rarely touched, that is exceptional work, that is rarely done, that we are obligated, I feel obligated, the Roby Theater Company is obligated to work with that. There is such a plethora of talent. See, our Playwrights Laboratory, our advanced scene workshop over the last, I've been teaching for almost 40 years, and the talent I've seen go through, it's just breathtaking. That should be developed. That's where we focus in the Roby Theater Company. I'm not really interested, even though I, heard, I hold a Tennessee Williams, a Lillian Hellman, a, 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 a George Bernard Shaw, all of those, that work that was done, I, even though I look at it and I say, this is wonderful, wonderful work. What a great play. What a wonderful writing. What stylistic work that really is just commendable. But I'm not going to spend our meager budget on producing a black production of death of a salesman thank you i'm not doing that let's do the fabulous miss marie yes. please <laughs> can i do can i play can i come in and do the fabulous miss marie we were gonna do it <laughs> i love that play <laughs> it is a wonderful play again you know but the principle is that what we do again about founders found a particular organization for a specific purpose. Again, all of that Eurocentric work, 
I grew up watching that. A lot of it was inspiring to me. But then when I got into studying, it wasn't a place for me. Then we have some questions. Um, Nicole? Yes. Hi, Mr. Guillory and everyone. Um, my question is, I'm new. I, the closest I've ever been to theater is watching it. So, and I want to be definitely on the stage and I totally understand that it's going to take time and I wanted to know if you will be offering any beginner courses or um, workshops in September as well or any time after. Or if not, what's the best thing that I could do um, right now until I can wait, until I can get in your presence physically? <laughs> are, are, are you're an actor? Yes. You have a resume? Yes. You've done work? Yes. Here, yeah. I don't know. Well, what like just small projects, um, independent films and stuff like that. So. Work. Yeah. And it's legitimate work. Yes. Uh, send me a headshot and a resume, first of all. Okay. Send it to the Roby, Ben Guillory at the Roby Theater Company. Ben Guillory at Roby Theater Company, not the Ben Guillory at Roby Theater Company dot org. The email address is in the chat box. We have two more qu hands raised. Who's next? Here's Terry. And I think Kim had his, I, thought, I saw Kim waving. And there's Ruby. Yeah. Levy, Levy Lee just raised his hand. There were two others, but Lee. I lost it. Okay. Yeah, All right, they're, on mute. they're on mute. You need to. Uh, no, I unmuted them. Raise, okay. Who's next? I think it was Kim and Terry. Okay, you've unmuted. Terry's unmuted. Okay, there we go. Thank you. And Kim, hi, everybody. Um, Hello. Okay. Can I? Can I? Can I chime in? Okay. Ooh, give your so, Terry a chance first. Then, then you thirdly. And then okay. Okay. okay thank That's you, fine. guys. Um, hi, everybody. Ben, good to see you as always. Um, I'm in Maryland, so uh, and as some of you know, um, I'm out here dealing with. Um, probate and the disposition of my parents' estate. Uh, they passed away, my mother last year and my father the year before that. So for four and a half years, uh, it's going on. I have been completely detached from my own life. And that's not a complaint. It's, it just is what it is. And I have found it difficult to move forward in, quote, my life. Um, I've been doing a lot of self-care, which is keeping me emotionally, physically, and psychologically on top of what I'm dealing with. And so um, that coupled with Corona, uh, I, just, I just feel very uh, removed from the process and having difficulty getting engaged. So I'm, I'm just thinking okay. that when I, when I get back to LA, that's when I can reconnect. Um, I know all the things I should do, but that's, there's still difficulty in doing that. Um, anyway, my question is this. Being a fair-complected African-American woman, I have found it difficult to find my place in theater in particular. I've been lucky to, to get some good parts. I actually did live with the play Children of the Night. Uh, Brock Peters, we had it at his place uh, mm. many years ago, and then it did, it did well enough to go to the Ebony Showcase Theater before it was taken over by uh, Nate Holden. Um, but it's just always been a struggle to get cast when you don't exactly look African-American. So Ben, if you wanted to weigh in on that in terms of where we are now in 2020, 
uh, versus, uh, you know, where we were. In short, Terry? Yes, I'm short also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. yeah, I think I'm going to make comedy my next thing. Okay. <laughs> All right, good timing on that one. I, I, it's visual. And there are a lot of people who, who take that as a first reference point. Those of us who are black know that I got blue-eyed cousins, first cousins, who are blonde-haired and blue-eyed, Louisiana. And you know what a mountain pot that is. So those of us who run black theater companies know how that works and will recognize you. And if they don't, shame on them. And I guess that doesn't help you if they don't. But those of us who do will know. And take that into consideration. You can have a family that has a whole rainbow of sepia color. You know, you, me, Levi Lee, uh, Akosawa, uh, uh, Martha, uh, Stephen Blackburn up there. Look at him. He could be black, probably is. He wrote a great play about Frederick Douglass, so I don't know what he was doing. He probably, you know. <laughs> so, uh, again, really, in all seriousness, those of us who understand that, I think... It's not being sympathetic, it's being factual. Because that's our lot in this country, is that we run a myriad of, of the color uh, spectrum. Well, in closing, I just wanna say, <clears throat> I'm noticing on television, and of course this is pre the, the situation of uh, you know Black Lives Matter right now, but clearly television has opened up in a, in a somewhat big way in terms of casting, you're seeing, and people are doing all kinds of other stuff on Netflix and Hulu and other formats to get their work out there. Um, and so we see, you know, an opening for the LGBTQ community. Um, we're just, you know, primetime television with a gay mixed straight family. Um, mm -hmm. Most of them are white though, I did notice that. So you don't see a lot of that in the community, but there has been an opening of the door in terms of casting. So that gives me some hope. Yes. That's all I want. That program posed. Hmm. Amazing. Exactly. A lot of ground. Yeah, exactly. So wonderful work in it. But Thank okay. you. Kim was, I think, next. Kim was question. next. Hello, everybody. Uh, Terry, I'm in uh, the Maryland area also if you need a scene study partner. I'm in the D.C. Maryland area, so let's make that happen. Because uh, that's what Ben encourages us to work together and to always be working. So I'm here. So, uh, Ben, um, I'm wondering what your thoughts you are. I how to reach you, Kim. You could put it in the, if you privately message her in chat. Okay, will do. Okay. Uh, ben, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the create the importance of creating teams because I noticed that people like Spike Lee works with the same people all the time and they nurture young talent and uh, there seems to be this movement towards the younger artist creating teams and nurturing young talent and making sure that they open doors for a team and so that the the craft is constantly pushed forward and passed down from generation to generation. How do you think we as a artistic community are doing with kind of sharing and helping and opening doors for each other or just creating opportunities to keep working? Because you do it at the Roby Theater to be sure. You know, you, you nurture a lot of young actors, you help them to understand the business. But I guess I'm wondering what your thoughts are in general of how we're doing as a community in relationship to this this uh, industry that you so vividly and well described as it relates to certain people in the industry still having a particular mind state and haven't really changed their mind about how to use us and tell our stories. We should. Yes, yeah, certainly, Roby, that's part of founding 
part of the founding mission statement is to cultivate. And as far as television goes, I think that's happening. I, in fact, I know that's happening. One, again, one has to be a self-starter. One must be a self-starter and impose, and I'll use that word, impose and assert themselves, but be ready, be ready, be prepared, do one's homework so that when the opportunity presents itself, one is ready, one is cocked, aimed, and can fire, pull the trigger so that they can take this home and do it. Can we do it enough? I think so. Obviously, there's more. Obviously, because there's different generations. I've been here since 83, and I, I have seen people come and go. I mean, and I mean, some of a whole generation that I used to watch as a younger person, I watch them do this and just admire them. They're gone. They have passed away. And the next generation has taken its place. The Delroys, the Denzels, the Dannys, the, uh, the uh, Violas, uh, all, all of those folks who have been toiling in the vineyard, so to speak, and have become notable artistic figures that have true, true, thriving careers. And a lot of those people, people come to me and say a lot, oh, why don't you get enough support from these? You're in Hollywood. You should get support from this folks. You should get support from that folks. And I tell them that when I look at some of those people and I actually try to see what they're doing and why we're not getting the kind of support that I think we should be getting from very wealthy and successful artists, I find that many of those self-successful and wealthy artists are supporting what they think they should be supporting. They are foundations. They're doing medicine. They're doing education. They're doing whatever they think they choose to do. But back to your, your question, I think it's, it's going on, Kim. I think it's going on. It should be going on more. They have to have places where this can thrive. In the, uh, I'm watching Netflix. I hadn't watched Netflix before, but there is so much work on there from all over the world. I'm seeing work from Africa that is us. And I'm saying, huh, I didn't know about that. And it's exceptional, exceptional writing, exceptional performances, and exceptional productions that are just extraordinary work. And I don't even know who these actors are. The faces that I see, I say, well, who is that? So, yeah, all over the world, we may not just be, you know, Hollywood is up to its yeah, I don't even say that. Hollywood's got kind of its its own bailiwick, and not everything can be measured by that. Although, because we're in the thick of it, and we're, that's where we're, we, many of us, are focusing our our sights. Um, we're yeah, yeah, Hollywood, right? And whatever that, whatever the hell that means, I'm not sure. You know, it's an abstract concept, Hollywood, you know. People talk in terms of Hollywood did this to me or Hollywood's doing that for me. No, you know what happens is that people, specific people, support or don't other specific people. And one must cultivate those relationships because it comes down to that. Thanks, Bill. Lee. Hey, hey, everybody. Um, you know, I, I, I can talk about theater 24-7. Um, I love it. Um, just a couple of things. Um, I wanted to chime in on the, the non-traditional casting, blind casting, or whatever. Just really quick. You know, one of the things I noticed as an actor was that when I was working on 
plays that were written by white um, playwrights and uh, some of the classical classic stuff, I found that I had a real problem uh, connecting to the material on an emotional historical level. Whereas when I'm working on a, a play by a black playwright or a person of color, that's already built in. It's just like right there. I mean, especially if it's a good play, as soon as I'm open and reading, I'm connected. I'm connected. I would have to create that, <clears throat> that element, you know, when I was working on a play by, um, by a white author. Um, second, second thing, um, I, I was nurtured and grown to really appreciate just talent across the board. And um, back in the day when I was a young actor, I used to have this thing about Marlon Brando to me was the greatest actor of all time. And and I wanted to be like Marlon Brando. I'm gonna be the black Marlon Brando. That was my thing. And I had a mentor, Nathan George, who some of you may know, may not know, but Nathan won the, um, the Obie and the John Medesk Award for a play called um, No Place to Be Somebody by Charles Gordon in 1973 at the Public Theater in New York City. And he was one of my mentors. He passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, we were very close. And I went by his house, you know, I'm young, I'm, I'm, I'm excited, I got all this energy. And, and I said, Nathan, I want to do Streetcar Named Desire. And he said, why? I said, because Marlon Brando did it, and I'm going to do it. He said, Lee, Marlon Brando already did it. I'm like, but, 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 no, 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 but, Lee. He said, look, he said, if you want to act in a great play, write it yourself. <laughs> and when he said that, it was like, like someone hit me over the head with a sledgehammer. And I had a copy of um, On the Waterfront which Marlon Brando did, you know, I, I, I could have been a contender. And, and I went out and I started adapting that screenplay, and which became my very first play that same night. I started working on it. And that's what got me into writing because um, I was so tired of reading so many scripts, whether they were black or white, that did not resonate with me and especially white scripts, you know, and I was like, what, what, uh, you know, because we were always the neighbor, always the supporting character, always the best friend, or, you know, and it's like, no, we are so much more than that. And we have so many more stories to be told. So I guess it fell to me to do some of that. But, you know, acting is always my first. I say acting is my love, writing my responsibility. So anyway, that's enough out of me. I'm done. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rob, Robbia is next, and then Mel. Hi, hi, Mr. Guillory. Hello, everyone. Um, yes. Uh, so my question is, <clears throat> Mr. Guillory, I recently became familiar, or or introduced to rather, um, Dr. Sherelle Luckett and her black acting methods, but very recently, so I have not had opportunity to read it yet. I just wanted to know if you have read it, if you're familiar with her and what your thoughts are on this black acting methods. Say her name again, please. Uh, Dr. Sherelle Luckett. I don't know her. She wrote a book, right? Yes. Um, it's supposed to be the first or the only I, I, I dare not say the only, but it's it's hailed as the only uh, book on black acting approaches or black acting methods. <clears throat> oh, I don't know it. I'd like to know it. It's okay. the book called the title of the book. It's called uh, Black Acting Methods. Black Acting Methods. Mm -hmm. She um, is a theater professor, a uh, publisher. I'd have to pull that up. But yeah, she's a theater professor who supposedly <clears throat> came up with this method for black actors. Um, and like I said, only recently became familiar. And so I didn't know if maybe you had heard of her and this book as well. 
How do you spell her last name, Luckett? Sure. Um, L-U-C-K-E-T-T. Sherelle. And it's Black Acting Methods. Mm -hmm. Sherelle with an S or a C? With a S. S -A, uh, S H A R R E L L. Sharrell. Okay. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. S -A -R -E. Well, R E S H A R R double R E L L. Got it. Yeah. Well, um, I've been looking for him, and the only one that I have found was the one I mentioned earlier by Gus Edwards. And uh, okay. his book talks in principle for black artists, actors of color. And then he interviews uh, Douglas Hearn Award, uh, who has important insights as well. So well, that's, hmm. I'll find okay. it. All right. And I'll, I'll read it too then and, and see what I can find out. It's a, yeah, it's good. It's about time. It's about time. There should be more. Uh, there probably are. We just don't know about it. Ernie McClintock. Ernie McClintock. A jazz acting theater. Jazz acting. Hmm. Ernie McClendell. McClintock. Can you McClint can M small c, capital C, L I N T O C K. Got it. Thank you. McClintock, he took over for um, uh, working on uh, August Wilson's plays. After no, that's, that's, that's McClendon. Oh, Ernie McClintock. Yeah. Okay. He was, Ernie was the founder of the African American Studio of Acting and Speech in New York City back in the 70s with uh, Lou Gossett. Hmm. Every black actor that was in New York had studied with him, even Denzel and Sam and them. They all studied with him at some point. His jazz acting technique. Hmm. Yeah, jazz acting. That's the second time I've heard that title. You know who else used to do that, Lee, is uh, Dick Anthony Lee. Williams. Yes. Dick yeah. Anthony. And Bea Richards as well. Mm hmm Yeah. Does Bia have a book out? I don't, I can't remember now, but I know that when we studied with her at the Inner City Cultural Center, she would always refer back to jazz acting technique. Mm -hmm. I studied with her at Inner City Cultural Center back in the 80s. Um, is it my turn? Well, I'm going to stand on this limb and jump. As actors, when we grab a character or we're asked to be a character, again, I will say it is our job to analyze that script, analyze that character. If that, like the lady said, you have to fart in order to smell like the reality of that character, because when you are that character, people remember the character when they see you, they don't remember you. When I did the Wild West stunt show at Knott's Berry Farm from 85 to 90, and I was the second African-American actor to be a actor and stuntman, and I did nine different characters in nine different shows, and we did a show every hour. I did over a thousand live shows. I was looked at as the undertaker, the ghost town kid, the marshal, the medicine man, and then I started studying with Ben so that I wouldn't lose track of being a theater actor doing street performance acting. When I did Shakespeare, A Midsummer Night's Dream, and I played Tathias, I looked at him and I took what Shakespeare wrote and I made him a black Theseus. I didn't look at him, oh, he's a white actor and I can't do it. Then. I looked at him as a character. And that character had a truth that needed to be told. And I told the truth of that character. I think it's our responsibility as actors. Bea Richards said, I don't care what technique you use. As long as you are telling the truth, people see you as the character. I love Denzel. 
And we've had this discussion a thousand times. Denzel, I love your work, but I always see Denzel. When I look at Jamie, I see that guy who was homeless living underneath the concert hall. I see Jamie as those different characters. And I'll probably take this to my grave, but, and I had this discussion in the Chekhov workshop for two weeks. We have a responsibility as actors to tell the truth of that character and bring the writer's words to life. Once you take an act, when you take that workshop, Jonas, from Ben, and he'll have you come in and you do that scene. And just when you think, I got this, shit, I'm kicking ass, I got this. Ben's going to make you see another perspective that you forgot. So you have to operate from that aspect of love and come into it with an open mind. I just did the Black Theater Festival and I did 10 different readings in 10 different plays. I didn't even get a chance to use the tickets that I had bought. Why? I concentrate on the work. I concentrate on the craft, the responsibility of the actor to tell the truth and do his homework. I'm going to shut up now. Okay, we only got about five minutes left. We should wrap this up. And uh, you know what Terry had said at the beginning. Uh, is, is, let's take one more, one more question. I don't know if anybody's Okay, answered. okay. So I just wanted to follow in on what Mel said. Because that's that's very right on target. When you look at Denzel, you, you know I'm still very entertained by him. But you're absolutely right. I always see Denzel. So Ben, what's the not what's the difference, but what's the significance or whatever it is between a Denzel actor who brings Denzel to the fore every time, but he nails it. It seems like versus somebody who goes into a character that is separate and apart from them and doesn't matter. If, if, if the work is good and you're entertained and you're suspended in your disbelief. The difference? I don't know. I'll go back to what Duke Ellington said one time. Somebody said to Duke Ellington, what kind of Lean music? forward, Ben, into the mic. Somebody said to, I'm using a, a Duke Ellington example. Uh, Duke, somebody asked Duke Ellington, what kind of music you listen to, Duke? And uh, uh, do you listen to classical music? He said, yeah. He said, do you listen, listen uh, to Dixieland? He said, yeah. He said, do you listen to Country Western? He said, yeah. And then Duke said, if it's good, it's good. Exactly. Okay. If it's Denzel yeah. doing good work. And yet, what, you know, we're talking about a guy that is probably one of 10 guys in the world that is a bona fide movie star. Right. Right. That has we've watched him grow up in the movies. Mm -hmm. He went to ACT. I was there. We were both there together at the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. I watched him do projects. We knew each other up there, and uh, he was a you know we were. I was he was more of a kid than I am because I'm older. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he was working very hard. He's been working hard all this. this life. You see him. <laughs> By the way, when you see him do uh, training day, yes, and when you see him do something else, fences, fences, huh? Fences. fences. Yes, with glory. Glory was his best work. Hurricane. Uh, Hurricane was his best work. Hurricane was his best work. True. Uh, uh, Hurricane. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, again, you know, we all identify in different ways with, with different performances. But when you have a body of work like that. Right. Yeah, 50 films? Over. Yeah. I mean, you have, when you have a body of work like that that you can take in and measure, well, you're going to get a lot of things going there. You're going to get a lot of things. Oh, that, he just walked through that part. That wasn't nothing. Took that, that was the money. That was about money. Because, you know, you, got, you have that job that you take to fix the roof. <laughs> that you take because this is what you became an actor for and there's no money but this is what I became an actor for to do this August Wilson play but there's other thing that I did that was uh, daytime drama but they pay me my, my rate which is $2,700 a day and okay. <laughs> are you kidding me 
All right, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Listen, everybody, let me say. Uh, Thank you, Ben. Thank Mel. you, Ben. Uh, Thank you, Jerry. It's really a pleasure just talking to everybody and seeing everybody. I don't, it's, just, and, uh, it's just great. It's hey, good. Levy. Hey, hey. With <laughs> Matt, Thais. Uh, so we'll see. Ben, ben, you have a question in the box about how can the group uh, contact each other? Uh, what are next steps? Here, and I believe here, Thais has the last question. One, one, one thing. If you leave your contact information and email address in the box, we will get the email address and put it out to uh, as a contact sheet. For those who want to contact whoever they want to contact, that will be, a, if you want to, it'll be your choice if you want to leave it in there. And I, some people don't want to get contact. <laughs> What what I wanted to say is that, you know, when you were talking, Mel, about the character and stuff and what you were talking about, I find that sometimes a lot of actors don't want to go that deep because it takes work to go that deep. Mm -hmm. And they play the caricature of what they think that character should be instead of really going in and finding out who you are. Because I think, to me, I am all those people. I make myself become that person, really become that person, not just to, to be the caricature of what I've seen somebody outside or what I've observed, because as actors, we have to observe everybody and watch people. And, and you can take some things, but I think that you have to really become that instead of becoming what you think from the surface. I think it's all from the inside out. And if we don't work from the inside of us and bring it and they let it come. And then there's a spiritual thing I think that happens that actors should ha have happen as well, because I think we should, that person should embody us. And it's a spiritual, I don't know, for me, it's almost like the character becomes itself, its own self, and then pours itself in me. And then all of a sudden I have the, if the character has been, whatever I played a prostitute and and all of a sudden I had this bruise on my leg and I was like how did I get this bruise on my leg and I just think that the character within came in and gave me a bruise or gave me something to manifest that that person because when the writer was writing that character was speaking to the writer so I need that character to come and embody me and 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 just like almost like an outer body experience of letting to where sometimes I've done work to where I don't even know. I'm like, when I'm finished, I was like, Oh, what happened? I mean, I know what happened, but it's like, you're just you know, there. Your concept is correct. Sometimes we channel the, the work. <laughs>